If you are starting a vertical farm and don't know where to begin or which technology would suit your needs, then reach out to the experts at Cultivated. As indoor farm brokers, they help connect you to the right technology and ensure your project is successful. Best of all, their service is free because they work on behalf of their partners. Visit Cultivated.com to learn more. And that's spelled C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-D.com or click the link in the show notes. The first thing I saw with that was I can have an impact on the world. That's the first thing I saw. It wasn't how much money I could make or I didn't know what it was going to take, but I said I could feed the world. That's the first thing. And they had it in small containers and that. And so what we done, and when I looked at this, I said, okay, a small container produces 3,000 pounds of food a month. I need to have produce more than that to feed the people I want to feed and also the customers I'm pursuing. Welcome to the Vertical Farming Podcast, weekly conversations with fascinating CEOs, founders, and ad tech visionaries. Join us every week as we dive deep into the world of vertical farming with your host, Harry Duran. Vertical Farming Podcast, Season 4. Welcome back. First time listeners, if you are looking for a show where I interview some of the most fascinating CEOs and founders from the world of vertical farming, then you are indeed in the right place. I'm your host, Harry Duran. In case you missed last week's episode, I had on Dandridge Melton, CEO of Vertical Growth Farming Systems. It's an organization that's changing the way the world approaches hunger, malnutrition, natural disasters, and the effects traditional farming has had on our environment, and to do it through their unique container farms. Highly engaging conversation I had with Dan. Please check that one out. This episode, I have the pleasure of speaking to Ray Uritia, founder and CEO of Terra Firma Foods. It's an organization looking to develop vertical farms and an innovative way to grow organic crops. We talk about Ray's illustrious business background and how his charitable nature led him to the vertical farming industry. We talk about Terra Firma Foods and the challenges they're going to be facing as a new upstart in this industry, their plans to develop and franchise their model. It's a term I hadn't heard before, so I was grateful to Ray for explaining that to us across the U.S. and eventually nationally and internationally. He shares his unique viewpoint of other competing vertical farming systems and his belief on acting on ideas. Finally, Ray speculates on what the future holds for Terra Firma Foods, the roadmap they have planned, and invites listeners to join him and his organization on the journey. This one's a little bit different in that Terra Firma is just getting off the ground and it's been interesting to have this discussion with Ray because I'm always curious as an entrepreneur what folks' plans are uh, when they're starting something in an industry such as vertical farming and having spoken to so many folks who've paved the way and have launched multi-million dollar projects. It's easy to see how Ray has his work cut out for him. What I thought was fascinating was how his background and his connections and his previous jobs and leadership roles have really prepared him for this moment in time. So it'll be fun to see how this plays out for Ray, and I'm really rooting for him. This episode is also brought to you by Indoor AgCon. Whether you're starting up or scaling up, Indoor AgCon can help you grow your vertical farming business. And this year, the trade show and conference for vertical farming and CEA heads to Caesars Forum Las Vegas from February 28th through March 1st. They're co-locating with the National Growers Association show, and you can expect to explore an expo floor filled with new product resources and business solutions. You'll be able to attend educational sessions led by top CEOs and thought leaders, connect with peers, grocers, and other potential new business partners at their fantastic networking events, at which I'll be a part of, or at which I will be attending (laughs) one of those. Uh, I'm really looking forward to attending my first vertical farming conference, Indoor.ag. I will be there in Vegas and try not to lose too much money at the poker table. (laughs) Head on over to indoor.ag to register. They've been kind enough to grace us with a registration code for 25% off. Use VFPOD22, that's VFPOD22, for that discount on your ticket. We've got a special project just launching. It's the Vertical Farming Jobs Board. This is something that's been several months in the making, and... 
It was a soft launch this week. You may have seen it mentioned on our socials. Head on over to verticalfarmingjobs.com. If you are a company needing to list your vertical farming job, for listeners of this podcast, use special promo code VFJ podcast. That's VFJ for vertical farming jobs, VFJ podcast, all one word. And for folks that are listening to this podcast, you'll get 75% off the current fees for submitting your job. So it's a special thank you for listeners of the show. And we'll have that on for a couple of weeks. And I'll only be mentioning this code on the podcast. So it's thank you for folks that have been listening. And you have a job to post verticalfarmingjobs.com. One more bit of housekeeping before we jump into the episode. Thanks for being patient. We have a couple of reviews that came in. It's always a fun thing to do. Read out those reviews. Uh, the first is from a author that I cannot pronounce because it was in Japanese. <laughs> I believe the name, but it came through on December 9th. It says, I'm new to the space. And as I was doing the research, I've simply typed in vertical farming just to catch up on some episodes on the topic. And I was surprised that there was a whole show dedicated to the topic that's been going on for several seasons. Really informative to hear from different people in different companies, business models, and functions, helping me to acquire a holistic lens to the industry. I love hearing from different leaders and can truly feel that their passion for the, of their passion for the job. The podcast has helped me immensely to get an understanding of the industry and the challenges they face. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that review. Next one is from Evan. He writes, I absolutely love this podcast. I happened to come across this during the quarantine days, and this podcast is the reason why I entered into the field. I can't explain it, but I just love the conversation. The knowledge and insight is powerful. And lastly, Tyler, whose review came in early this month, really enjoyed the podcast. Guests and discussions, highly recommended. Great podcast with key leaders in indoor ag. Thank you all for leaving reviews. If you would like yours read out, head on over to ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. And as you can hear, we'll be more than happy to read those out on future episodes. Okay, lots to cover in this intro. Thank you for being so patient. Let's jump into this conversation with Ray. So Ray Uritia, founder and CEO of Terraponics, thank you for joining me on the Vertical Farming Podcast. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So we're mid-January, just out of curiosity, how's the new year treating you so far? Uh, really well, thank you. Yeah. Well, we have some news here in about two weeks uh, of some initial funding. We're really excited about that because it allows us to do a lot of different things that uh, we've been wanting to do. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. It's really, really going well. Really going well. Okay. And where's home for you? Uh, Chicago. Chicago, okay. Just southwest, about 40 miles. Okay. And uh, given that you're in Illinois, is the idea or just kind of like the generational legacy of farming, is that something that had ever been on your, your mind or something you thought about? Well, interesting enough, when I was a younger, small kid, grew up in Michigan. I grew up in the northeast part of Michigan, uh, just north, about 30 miles north of Detroit. I worked at a farm. Uh, some of my buddies, their families were second, third generation farmers with potatoes and vegetables and rhubarb and peppers, you name it. And I'm 11, 12, 13 years old. And, you know, they always need help in the summertime. So us kids helped, and uh, it was a good experience, not knowing then that I'd be doing this today, because it's not so much that I was actually the farmer, but I had the experience in understanding the process they went through in delivering food, and how we're going to deliver it differently, hopefully more organic, more cleaner, and actually transport, our transportation is going to be down to zero for the most part. Okay. Talk a little bit about your, your business journey. You don't have to go all the way back to when you get out of college, but <laughs> <laughs> the, the shortened version. And it'd be interesting to track how that's changed over time. Well, I, I'll just start when I was uh, 16, I had my own business. I was a landscaper. A buddy of mine and I said, we gave us something to do. We didn't want to work at fast food restaurants. So we created this company. We, our, both our dads had trucks. And we did that all summer. We made good money at it. And that was the, the taste of that. I've always wanted to be on my own. So for the last 25 years, I've been on my own. I've had different companies in real estate, fuel. I created a, um, a server and a platform that was going to try to eliminate real estate people and lawyers and funding and I think it was going to be automated. But like all uh, disruptors, the challenge always is getting the money to do it and get people to believe that this is the best way to go. And then the real estate market changed again. And I was, I was at a time when... Real estate was plenty, plenty of properties, and 
a lot of new people that want to get into real estate. And uh, I think it's happening again as we go into this year, next year, it'll happen again. It's interesting the, the, how much housing prices jumped after during just into the pandemic because people were leaving the cities and snatching up all these houses in the, in the, in the suburbs. I know a friend of mine lives on Long Island, and uh, he's saying that there's a group there that has been buying and overpaying for the properties just to take control of them. Wow. And nobody knows, and it's all different corporations, companies, and everything. They, nobody knows they're doing it, and they're renting them. So it's going to be an interesting time. We've still got a ways to go. I wrote an article for a magazine about three years ago where there were 2.5 million defaults in the single family mortgages. So if you look at the time with that crisis, there are 5.5 million defaults. So this is 2019. During the pandemic, we had 15 million defaults. I don't want to be in real estate, but that's kind of led me where I'm at today. But all those opportunities, challenges have geared me for what I'm doing now. And that's when we can buy more real estate Interesting. because of the farms. So background, education. <laughs> well, it's so funny because of the, the multiple threads, because I think about this, just this really thing that speaks to my heart about affordable housing, you know, and, and people having a, a roof over their heads, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You, you know, people are, if, if that base level is not met, like, you know, you have food, you have your shelter, you know, you have your health, people can't think of other things. They can't think of how to lift themselves up. And just, you know, as you were mentioning about that, I just, that's something that resonates with me. And it's probably a subject for another podcast or a deeper conversation or some, some, a conversation at the bar, but <laughs> it's something that I was thinking about. Well, and that's where food comes in. You know, the necessities of life are eating, shelter, clothing. And in today's world, it's more transportation because of the way we live dispersed through a marketplace. But when I look at eating, it's always been in my mind. It's always been in my heart because I couldn't understand why a country like ours has so many hungry people. Or a country like ours, we have food shelters and shelters for people to live in because they have no housing. And I don't know if you ever worked at a food bank, but when you look at these people's eyes, they didn't come to the table and go, when I grow up, I want to stand in line for get a meal. They didn't do that. So when we look at today, I think we have an opportunity with the vertical farms that we're building to actually help those local communities. And one of the things we're going to be doing, so I created a charity when I first started this company with the thought of giving farms away around the world in the United States. So then my... Regular farms or vertical farms? Yeah, just uh, uh, vertical farms oh, yeah. in communities because we could plant them anywhere. Sure. And then, uh, I don't know if I was dreaming or... I was like, how can I do this now? And I prayed about it and I said, okay, how can I do this now? And what I came up with is that 10% of all production of every single farm in the local community will be given away. And that's roughly on the low end about 26,000 pounds a month. Now it's greens. Sure. It's not meat. It's not milk, it's not any other type of food product, but people don't eat healthy greens because they can't afford it. You and I go to the store and pick up a five ounce package of spinach. It's supposed to be organic and healthy and we're paying five bucks for it and we pay it because it's healthy in our heads. Yeah. Yeah, it feels like part of it is just an education process in terms of understanding that this is a viable alternative for folks that grow up in low to moderate income neighborhoods when they walk out their door, they're more likely to see a Burger King yes. than, a, than a co-op, right? Yep. And how do you change that? You know, you know, as I mentioned, I was a kid, I was able to work on a farm. So we, uh, I remember there's about 10 of us one time. It was one of the hottest days in the summer, like 95 degrees. We're out in the middle of the sunshine, hoeing and weeding peppers. We're going in and out, in and out. A quarter mile rows all the way down, turn around, come all the way back. Well, with that being said, once we got them to a point of harvesting them, we'd go down and pick them, put them in crates, we'd wash them, and then we'd put them in a cooler. Now you think about that for a second. You cut something, and then you wash it and chill it. It's wet. Well, then in the, about 4 o'clock in the morning, my friends, the ones that were driving, said, hey, you want to come with me and go down to the market? There's two markets in Detroit, the Eastern Market and the Western Market. We used to go to the Eastern Market, and we'd drop them off. And that's where the, pro, the stores and that would come and get their goods and ship them out to the stores. My point being is that that process we look at is very archaic because when you cut something and chill it right away, it's already dying. Chilling does not preserve it. It watering it, if you take anything that's wet and you chill it, it's going to get cold and freeze. 
when it freezes, then it's got to thaw out, right? So, you know, and I think that's where the grocery stores and the economic areas that need help can't get what they're looking for because by the time it gets down to that part of the food chain, most of it's already sucked up by the stores. I use that word, I apologize for that, but it's taken up by the stores. And then, you know, people have to squander to get the rest of it. And there's not enough to squander. There's not enough to go after. A friend of mine is one of my partners in other types of businesses, but he's a pastor. And he goes, Ray, in the foothills of uh, Kentucky, in the Appalachian Mountains, he goes, their meal consists of a gas station at the bottom of the hill that has the burritos and the pizza. It's all frozen. The Mountain Dew. Yeah. He goes, that's where you got to be. <laughs> and it is. And uh, we'll, we'll get there, but not today. So prior to Terra and... Are you still with RAU? Because I was interested to to hear how some of the the work you've done there may have prepared you (laughs) when you think about strategy and and sales and marketing for Terra. Yeah, RAU uh, was formed about uh, almost 20 years ago now. And the premise behind that was to work with high net worth people and how to help them in investments and then also asset protection. And through that time, what's interesting enough is that a lot of people aren't protected properly even if they have millions of dollars, these are minimum $10 million of net worth, and they didn't have enough protection. In fact, I could I, I could easily access and look at their assets without them even knowing it because they weren't protected properly. I didn't do anything with the information, I just kind of see it. So from a strategic perspective, it taught me how to raise capital. It taught me, I came in contact with some uh, high level individuals in the bank industry and funds and how to work with individuals like that. So as I started asking for my own funds for this company, it uh, the talk track, the presentation, in real estate too. When I was in real estate, it was the same thing. You had to ask for money, and the one things investors don't, money investors don't want is theory. Show me what you got, and have a contract on it. In this case, what well, to push some of the pushback we're getting is, show me, what do you got? Show me what it tastes like. Show me where you're growing it at. So the funds we've been looking for is actually been for our R&D center, and I think we got that now. Based on everything I heard, everything I signed, I think we got that now. And uh, but that had all the, everything. All my experiences, as your life experiences, has prepared you for what you're doing today. Yes. And how do you expand on it? I was in the fuel business for a while too. I did that for two years. I had a company. The challenge with that, I didn't have enough, I didn't have enough money. And uh, I was talking to a buddy of mine who owns a, a refinery. He goes, Ray. He goes, I'm going to do a billion dollars this year. I can't even get a seat at the table because it's a five trillion dollar a day business. Wow! And then, then you look at food. I believe food and growing of food is going to be that billion dollar business for anybody that's involved in it for the next 20, 25 years. And but all those milestones of what we've been through and what I've been through has prepared me for this: how to manage, how to scale, how to get you know draw good people, what to look for, and you know, all the things go with it. And it's connections. It's all connections. I think a lot of people lose sight of that, especially early on. I think I became more aware of that when I started my own business in 2015, the podcast agency we, we now own. And I was what I started noticing is we have this uh, habit when we're in, in the corporate world of only changing our LinkedIn, looking at our LinkedIn profile when we need a job. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, and I was guilty of that as well. And, and now when I think about how valuable my LinkedIn community and connections are to me as a business owner and for building those you know, lifelong relationships, it's interesting. Like it's a completely different perspective on the importance of doing that over time. And you usually do it in the beginning without an expectation that you're going to get something in return. If you're looking for something, some a payback, it's a long wait. You have to pursue it with what the benefit of the relationship is. You're just saying, what does that really mean? You know, there's some that, you know, myself, I have like so many 3,500 connections. I try to always say happy birthday, congratulations, job anniversaries, those type of things. I do that every day. It's one of the first things I do. But there are only probably a dozen, maybe two dozen people I really communicate with all the time. Common interest. Now that we understand families and names and children and all things go with it, and that's a relationship. And then at the same time, if you need something, you reach out. Yeah. Can you give an example of a long-term or maybe even lifelong relationship that you've cultivated over the years that has just slow, grown over time and, and now you know is, is an important part of your life? Yeah, I'll look at uh, other than my wife. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's my CEO right now. His name is Sean Cortez. I met him eight or nine years ago through a third party 
and our personalities just hit it off. And it, it, what I loved about him, and I still love about him, is that he will do whatever it takes. He's an entrepreneur, entrepreneur. And when I look at entrepreneurs of that nature, that's what you need at the beginning. I had a company a long time ago, it was a communications company, uh, selling web conferencing and internet conferencing, uh, uh, video conferencing, audio conferencing. And one of the things that I learned from that was it's relationships and how to build them. And then with Sean, I could take him into any environment and he'll learn it and make it happen. But one of the things I did in that internet, that communications company, I hired professional managers. And professionals, and no disrespect to anybody that's a professional, they need a roadmap. They need something tangible to hang on to. An entrepreneur says, point me in the direction and get me there. <laughs> and they go. And that's Sean. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And that's him. And uh, we've been together now eight years. There's a couple others, maybe a little bit longer, but uh, I talk to him every day. That's awesome. So, Ray, I'm curious when this became something that showed up on your radar, like what, you know, indoor farming, controlled environment agriculture, vertical farming, call it what you may. But, like, you know, I know for me, the aha moment was reading the book Abundance by Peter Diamandis. And okay. there was a chapter in there about future technologies, vertical farming. I grabbed Dixon Despamia's book and I was off to the race. <laughs> <laughs> for me, it was an individual brought me the idea. He goes, look, he said, you could acquire the patents and the process. He says, take a look at this. Show me a small video clip. Harry, the first thing I saw with that was I can have an impact on the world. That's the first thing I saw. It wasn't how much money I could make or I didn't know what it was going to take. But I said I could feed the world. That's the first thing. And they had it in small containers and that. And so what we done, and when I looked at this, I said, okay, a small container produces 3,000 pounds of food a month. I need to have produce more than that to feed the people I want to feed and also the customers I'm pursuing. So we scaled it to 10,000 square feet. I go 100,000 square feet if I want to. I go 200,000 square feet. But my point is, when I first saw that, as you asked that question, I believe it was God that put it in my heart because I've always supported food banks and, you know, not every day, of course, but I serve that up and I go, why are people starving? We've got too much here in this country. Yeah, yeah. How can I help? And one of the things I learned, and it actually was Elon Musk's wife who said, if you're gonna be in a business, how's it gonna impact the world? I read that maybe five years ago. When I saw this, I went, that's my aha moment. That's how I impact the world. And we do it one, one city at a time, one farm at a time, but we can get there. And all the people are in it right now, whether they look at it that way or not, I think some of them do, because that's why they're in it, but I do believe collectively, we're all different. We all have the same goal, produce food. Healthier food than yes. our predecessors did in the actual farms themselves, and then also for the future. There's a, a Native American saying, and I always kind of mess it up a little bit, but it's this idea of when we think of our actions, we think seven generations back and seven generations forward. And so, you know, that's where the that this, the company, the cleaning company comes in and they think that way. So what are we doing now? And this is a challenge for some people where you, the full benefits of it may not be realized <laughs> for multiple generations after you're gone. Well, one of the things I've been working on, and I started when I first came in contact with this process, was a 100-year plan. Now, you can look at me. I got gray hair. I don't think I'll see it <laughs> fulfilled. But if I could lay some groundwork and they have other individuals get involved and carry it forward, I think it would be around for 100 years. There's a movie that came out was called, uh, it's on Netflix, it's called uh, The Secret, um, I think The Secret C. I may have messed up the name. Yeah, yeah. But five minutes into it, it's about the future in 2075. Oh, wow. And what do they mention? Vertical farms are here to have satisfy the world. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, so I says at least by 2075, we'll still be in business. <laughs> <laughs> so for folks that are new to our firma, how would you describe the business model and what's the roadmap look like? Well, the business model is that we're ag tech company and the produce is a, a byproduct of our technology and what we're bringing to the table. So when you look at technology, you, we have paralysis equipment for energy, but we can also use solar. We can also use wind and water, depending on what we look for. But this will be our energy source because we want to stay green and we also want to keep a low carbon footprint. We have automation. Automation doesn't speed up the growing process, but it assists in managing the farm itself. 
we have HVAC systems, we have CO2 systems, we have living soil, and all that's a technology in itself because you're taking soil from the outside, bringing it in and make it living. And what I mean by that is actually breathing and producing and very nutritional and carries a lot of nutrients in it. So when you look at that, what we're really bringing to the table is a faster, more productive way of producing food. And I think that's what people need to know about us. And the byproduct of that is in a single layer of farming, we can produce 266,000 pounds a month, which is equivalent to 40 acres. If we want to go three levels up, we could be, be create 120 acres of land and grow 900,000 pounds of food every single month. And it could be the, your, your most 14 popular greens. Some will grow faster than others, like spinach, kale, and arugula will grow faster than, say, bib lettuce or just lettuce. And cilantro will just be like wildfire because it just grows all the time. You can harvest almost every day if you wanted to. So we have those going for us. The other side of what we do is that as a farm, we're very mobile. So our footprint's only an acre and a half to two acres. Okay. And we build our own property, we build our own plants on here. So it's windproof and hurricane proof. And it's also to handle sub zero temperatures up to minus 150 or plus 150 degrees. And we maintain 70 degrees all, all the time, at all points. And then the CO2 process we use adds nutrients and life to the plants to help it grow the way we want to grow. And it's all monitored inside by cameras. We can monitor up to the height that we got to harvest it. And we can we have backup to the backup. And all that data is fed back to a central system. Again, going back to technology again. And whatever those stats teach us will help us for the future, either to grow differently or to grow more abundantly. Yeah, and so it's definitely a similar approach to a lot of the folks I've had on the show before. Um, so just getting a bit more specific, do you have models already for what these would look like? Are we talking like shipping container, like a freight farms model or a different footprint and style? This is actually a 10,000 square foot building. Okay. Uh, if I look at uh, App Farm and Plenty and Bowery, I just seen today there's a group building a 250,000 square foot facility. So ours is much smaller and by being smaller, it makes us more nimble. So as an example, and also we're in soil. Everybody else has been hydroponics, aquaponics, or aquaponics. And that's where, we, that's where we're really different. We're in terraponics. And it's, nothing, it's not new, new. There's companies around the, around the world using terraponics in the way, shape, shape, or form. But ideally, what they've been doing is marketing it through small gardens. We're taking a scale in it. Okay. Number one. Number two, the mobility. Let's say, for instance, here you have 400 stores. And one farm, and you're in four or five states. I could not just build one farm to satisfy you. Because... I still have distribution then. And if I harvest it today and I get it, and you're in Arizona just for conversation, and you got to get it over to Georgia, I still got to ship it. So, my ideal world is those 400 stores may require us to put up 10, store, 10 farms. Got it. So, that way, one of my objectives here with this is to be within 30 to 60 minutes from any customer, fresh every day. I'm going to be extreme here. But if you call me up and say, right, I have this in, in 30 minutes, I can deliver in 30 minutes. Now, is the customer going to do that? The challenge with that is if they got used to doing that, they do it all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's the point of being fresh. So we can cut it, harvest it, and deliver it the same day if we needed to. And what does that do for the store? And you had these 400 stores. Right now, and you probably heard this over and over again, in the store environment, 35 to 55% is waste by the time they get it. If I could hit that down to zero, was that due to your profit margins? You get more product to sell, and it's fresher. So uh, again, just getting into specifics here. So, what are some ideas to the point that you can discuss them about ideas to reduce that percentage of waste? Well, because you know we can deliver fresh every day, and our delivery point is from the store, from the farm to the store. So, if you're within 30 minutes of us, we're not that far away. So, let's say for instance, you say I want to pick up every 30 days or once a week because we can harvest every day if we need to. We can make that happen. And the other thing that we have is a 10 to 15 day longer shelf life. So we've all bought greens in the past. We've all bought produce from the stores or a produce company. And by the time we pick it up, by the time we get it home, with a couple of, we don't eat in a couple of days, we got waste. Now think of the waste they have when they first get delivered. Now who eats that? Not the store. 
they'll exchange it and then there's the distributor or the producer and if we can eliminate that and just bring it down to zero and that's it's an objective goal i think of all of us out in the farming area in the vertical farming area because if we don't address that then we're no different than a regular farmer and not to say they're bad people because we still need them yeah but we can make it better what's the timing look like in locations that you've where you're going to you're going to be starting well, based on what I know right now, and I share with you, I'm not going to go too much detail about the funding part of it. Our R&D center should be up within 60 days, and our next, our first farm should be up within 90 to 120 days. And the question I have, as you may have, where's that location going to be? Because if we could be anywhere, anytime, I'd like to have a customer online, and that's my my pursuit as a CEO and founder, is to bring somebody online to have that first one put in. Now, the things we're doing differently, so how we're helping the environment is this. Unlike some of the companies out there building farms that are going to manage them. So what happens there, you have more, you have personnel issues, you have hiring issues, you have wages and all things go with it. What we're doing is creating what we call a franchise model. Not a franchise, but a franchise model. And you may have heard of it before, but it is a joint venture agreement between two parties, whether it be an individual or a company or group. They invest into the, the, the farm, but they own it and operate it. And then we share in profits. And the reason I want to do that is a couple things. I know the Aldi's, the Kroger's of the world, Lowe's out of North Carolina, I'll take this, even Chipotle. They want local support with local owners. Again, we use you as an example here. If I go to you and I said, here's a franchise opportunity, and you're going to service this group here, and plus whatever else you get, you're local. And the people are going to hire a local. So it doesn't get any more local than that. And we satisfy the need of certain environments that want local representation. Support the farmer. And I don't know if you know where Lowe's is, but they're down in North Carolina. And Jim Logos got to have local. Well, we can do that. Some of our other uh, alternatives aren't as flexible because they take a bigger footprint. You know, so if you take a 250,000 square foot building, you're talking about $60 million input. Ours is not that high. We could do it in a very cost-effective way and have it run faster. We could have it producing food within 120 days, a time from start to finish. What's interesting for me, Ray, I think in this in these conversations is just talking to a lot of very well-established folks. I've spoken to plenty, Air Farms, Bowery, and then the folks Freight Farms, and then some of the solo farmers, and they've all you know, they're basically up and running. And it, this is probably, if I think about it, the earliest I've had a conversation with someone who's, you know, in, in at the stage that you are, where you're, you're just getting it off the ground. So it's interesting, because it, it'll be fun to watch your journey. And, <laughs> and at some point in the future, come back and share all the, the exciting wins you've had since we had this conversation. But I think what I'm curious about is just how you think about, do you think about competition? Do you think about how much education is involved in getting these folks on board as partners? And and what do you see you, as the challenges you'll have since you're you're not at zero, but I mean, in terms of getting clients, I'm curious how you think about that challenge. Um, if it's, if it's, let's look at competition. Throughout my career, everything I've ever sold or been part of, I never looked at anybody as being competition. I think they're always a compliment, we're a compliment to each other. We may do it differently, we may do it the same way. But the more of us out there, the more the word gets out. And I think, like, one of my advisors is in hydroponics. And I have another partner has got another hydroponics partner. He goes, Ray, we've got to put you two guys together. Why? We're doing the same thing, just differently. This one hydroponics group does tomatoes very well. We do greens very well. And the, the challenge is, Eric, we can't, nobody can do it all. And then if you look at the people side of it, I think I'm smart, but I'm not the smartest guy in the room. And I understand that. But I know how to get things done, how to make connections. I think with the franchiser, how do I get them interested? Most of these people have already had franchises. And they know what, what it takes to get that up and running. I think where we're different, our profit generation is going to be greater than some of the franchises out there. I mean, I know people who own Subways. I know people who own, what's that, hair cutlery, 15, 20 stores. And it's people intense. And the margins aren't as great as you think they are. When you're charging fifteen dollars, nine dollars for a haircut, it's hard to squeeze margin out of that. And you're splitting with somebody. And if you look at you know subways, they I know people have eight, ten, fifteen stores, but they have you know sixty, seventy employees, if not more, and they're not very dependable. These are young people. I mean, God loves young people, but they just 
their work ethic sometimes isn't uh, the best. You know, if you do get one that's the best, you better make them a manager or her a manager because <laughs> they hang around. But my point yeah. being is that I think the opportunity right now is because of the pandemic, it creates a perfect storm to bring people into our group because they're looking for alternatives right now. They're looking for a way to make a living, and they're also looking for a way to leave a, leave a legacy for their family. I believe the food industry for the next 25, 30 years is the new billionaires and millionaires and create legacies. The Carne- the folks who built the railroads, the Carnegies, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> DuPonts. <laughs> yeah, you know, look at the, look yeah. at the, the Chase and the Morgans, and yeah, yeah. The, those guys, they were ruthless in what they did, but they did it, and they just expanded. You know, one of my idols, if I can call him that, is Ray Kroc. Oh, yeah. The, McDon- the business modeling that he put together and the way he did it, I want to be the McDonald's of the vertical farm. You heard it here first? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> So how do you think about these challenges, Ray, as, a, as someone who's had this much experience in business and starting companies and then entering a field that you're, where you're still learning the, you know, the environment, the players, like what the industry is like? I don't know to what extent you started to engage with other folks in there or if, you're, or if you've started to attend conferences. So, you know, just kind of speaking you know, openly, what, what do you think is, is going to be the focus for you and where there may be challenges ahead? I think that the uh, challenge is speed to market. How fast can we get there? Yeah. But you know, there's the other, the other flip side of that saying is speed kills. So it's speed to market in a very methodical way. It's speed to market by getting the right clients on board. It's speed to market by getting the right personnel on board. And each one of them has its own task. And uh, I'm just one person. I have people on my team that I have to lean on to bring in some of those people and also to make sure that as we scale, I had a conversation this morning with them. I go, look, we're a team, and I think we're unique in what we bring to the table. So as we let other people in our team, we got to make sure they fit. So at this juncture, Harry, we get, we're looking for, I'm looking for entrepreneurs with a professional edge. And then over time, I'm looking for the professional edge with a little bit of entrepreneurialism in them because you have to have that no, uh, no rules. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember when I, I used to work at the... JP Morgan Chase, and I worked at E-Trade. So I, I was in corporate almost 20 years. They would try like to create this organization. They called it intrapreneurs. So you have entrepreneurial spirit, but you're still in the company. So I think I think there is room for folks that do have that drive, but still feel like the sense of needing that security of having that paycheck, yeah. you know, whatever security something like that provides nowadays anyway. But, <laughs> but I think some people like that. And so I think having that mix is going to be well suited because I think we're in an industry that's changing so rapidly that there are no rules about what is the right way to do things. And I think people that are open to seeing how things are shifting in the industry and, and what the latest is. And that's part of the reason I'm, I'm going to make it a point to be at the indoor.ag conference in Vegas okay. in at, at the end of February as well. Okay. There's another one in New York. It's actually a group out of the UK. I'll get you the name of it, but it's going to be in New York. It's a three day okay. and it's all about ag tech and farming and you know, we've been very fortunate with uh, Patty that uh, she's got us uh, in print and stories out there. I don't know if I sent any to you, but if I haven't, I will. And we're just trying to build us bigger than we are on one hand, but also that we're different. And so when you, when you, you ask me the question, you know, in terms of competition, I welcome anybody to talk to. I don't mind sharing my ideas because we live in such a world, there's 7 billion people in the world. If I think I'm the only one who has an idea like this, I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody else sitting anywhere, at, you know, a couple of hundred thousand miles, 15,000 miles away, whatever that is, they got the idea too. You know, I used to be a real estate coach at one time. I had a business called Pull the Trigger. And the reason I call it Pull the Trigger is that if you see something, make a decision, pull the trigger. Don't hesitate. But my point would be is that I believe in the next year, and majority of people do this with their gig jobs, they sit around the table with their spouse or their partner and going, what do we do next? We need to make more money. How do we do that? Is, is terra firma part of that solution? Is it a real estate business part of that solution? Is it something that I could feel independent? And the only thing I would tell anybody is things don't happen overnight. I've been working this for two years. So this is something that just, I had a blueprint. I scaled it. We have all the relationships in place. We have the uh, automation in place, the soil in place, the building uh, structures in place. We have the HVAC in place, the CO2 in place, the seeds in place. We have everything that we need 
to build a farm. Now I got to bring more people on board. That's my next step. So the challenge is uh, not just people. I hate to use the expression the right people. Yeah. In my past, I've had up sales teams. Okay. And I was never looking for anybody in the product I was selling. Because when they came in with no, and they had background experience, they thought they knew everything about the product and they weren't going to change their ways. So I went looking for the opposite of that. Yeah. I really have somebody that's hardworking, got good work ethic, and is willing to learn. Those are people I want. And so do you think about the next steps for you like as we're moving forward? And you mentioned you have, you're having early discussions about some funding that has just come in. So you know, what's next for you when you look out three months, six months from now? Like, What's going to be top of mind? What are you going to be thinking about day to day? The first thing is secure the money. And that's going to happen in about... Uh, in about two weeks. Okay. And I've already been committed to that, so that's uh, that's my train of thought. Uh, secondly, behind that is I've already been in talks with the uh, R&D center and the corporate office. Okay. I started that about six months ago. I had to back off on it because the money didn't come in fast enough, so I got to re-engage that. So that was number, that's number two. And number three and number maybe 1A is actually get the R&D center up and running. We have all the equipment, everything ready to go. We just got to make sure that we have a place to put it. And then bring the scientists on board full time in a facility that's comfortable to them and that we make their environment their environment. Everything, whatever equipment they need, whatever resources they need, they have it. Because I think one of the things companies do bad, I work for corporations myself in my younger life, is that they want you to do a job and they, they do a, uh, they have outfit you. They don't give you all everything you need, but they want it done right. Well, the only way to do it right is you got to spend a little bit of money to do the right, get the right tools to do it right whether it's add another person or assistant or something, but you got to have the right tools. And I want to make sure my team always has the right tools. And the second part of that that goes with, goes with that, another, you say, you say a challenge, I want them to be the highest paid in the industry. And you, the obvious reasons are there, but if they're the highest paid and we take care of them, you can't command passion, you can't direct it, you can't teach it. But if you complement it, with money in terms of a salary that they have a good living not thinking about that anymore and they gravitate to what they're doing they're good really good at what they're doing passion will come where did you learn that passion no just this, this that model just you know this idea because not everyone has that mindset of just paying you know sometimes they're just like let's get the get people in the door and just get them paid you know the, the cheapest we can and I, I agree with your model i'm just curious what you know where, where that's been building up yeah what brought that on is that i've seen too much of my career where people were underpaid and they're not happy and they're always talking behind their back behind the corporation's back and the manager's back that i'm not happy here i'm not making enough money and the thing to do though if you're not if you feel that comfortable then you got to leave but for me companies force their people out because of not taking care of them. I'm not saying by paying a million dollars a year because that's out of the question. There's no way you can do that. But I'm saying pay them above average or better than average and always keep them at the height of their, their career path. And then secondly, again, I talked about this morning. I said we have to empower people, empower them to make mistakes because out of mistakes you learn. Secondly, we have to pay them well. And thirdly, we have to have ability for them. They have to have a place to go. Because everybody, when anybody interview, you probably interviewed yourself, and now I have, where am I going from here? Yeah, yeah. And the manager looks at you with a stone-faced look goes, you'll be okay. Well, that doesn't mean anything to me. You know, everybody's going to be okay, but what does it mean to me? And is there room for me? In my career, what you're talking about is the entre entrepreneurial. I've always worked up for new divisions of big companies. They got funded by the master co the mother company, yeah, 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 and that was fun because there were no rules, and and a big budget. <laughs> yeah, you got a big budget and everybody's spending, and you had to get things you got to get done. And the only thing I was ever asked in my career was, if you make a mistake, make sure it doesn't cost the company that much. Okay, and that's my rule too. Yeah, you got to make mistakes. It just makes them to make sure they're not costly. So I think through time, I think people get mistreated. The old saying is treat people the way you want to be treated, and I think. People say that, but they don't re-execute it. And I want to execute. I always have. And sometimes to a detriment of myself, which isn't also right either. <laughs> yeah. As we wrap up, I'm curious why why now, why you? Well, as we talked about a few minutes ago, everybody has ideas. And ideas are only good as long as there's action on them. 
And for me to see this and think what I thought when I first saw this opportunity and not do anything about it, I'd be cheating myself, I'd be cheating the people I could possibly do it for, my family and other people that are around me. And I think when you see, I have it with my kids, I have seven kids from 19 to 38. And I always tell me, see something, do something. If you have an idea, act upon it. The worst could happen, could be wrong. But the worst could happen is that you're right and somebody else did it and you didn't. Yeah. Do you think about words like legacy or leaving an impact? Yes, I do. Legacy to me is, and we're looking at private asset uh, companies. There's a couple of companies out there that can give you seven years, seven generational worth of uh, wealth and opportunity. And, you know, I already have grandkids. Some of my grandkids are willing to give me great grandchildren, which I'm glad right now. It's good, keep it that way. <laughs> but I think of legacy all the time because my mom and dad and my grandparents on both sides never thought that way. It's not too much they maybe didn't think that way, but they never took action to make that happen. Not their fault, just exposure, education, type, those type of things. And if I know this already, I look long term. That's why I say I have a hundred year plan. It's not just for me, because I know I'm not gonna be here. You know, but if I could be here long enough to execute the foundation of it and then have them execute the rest of it. I have a grandson that's 20 years old, he's at Florida State University. I told him, I says, 10 more years can we see all this company? He goes, why 10 years? I go, because <laughs> I says, guys, you got to be like I'm already. <laughs> yeah. You have to be a little bit matured up to to, uh, to move in. He goes, but how do you know that, grandpa? I go. I've seen you as a little baby. You're smart. You got good. You got personality. You understand numbers. I says, you know, like I told you a long time ago, know the numbers. You own the company. And I said, but you got to know the numbers. And I says, I asked about his cousins. I go, how about uh, Caitlin? He goes, not Caitlin. Her sister Sienna. She's the one that's got the numbers head. Yeah, she's my uh, my uh, the two daughters of my son, who's a wealth manager at Merrill Lynch. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah. He's, she's got that mentality too. I says, well, well, she's ready, you know. But you know, whether we're keeping the family, if we don't keep in the family, here's the thing about a, a business, and you know already, two years we're in right now, it's about putting together, putting together, putting together. The third year is when you start growing to see the results of your labor. When you get from year three to year five, by the time you get to year five, the company has a personality of its own. It's not mine anymore. It's not about Ray. It's about the company and the people in the company. And I know this, I understand it very well. And as owners, we have to let go, can't hang on to it. Yeah. And teach my people that too, I wanna teach them that too. Was there anyone that comes to mind when you think of the word mentor? There's a few people. In fact, I was actually dreaming about that last night, the people, and I've seen them in my head. There's this gentleman by the name of Dennis Wardak. I was young, arrogant, stubborn, and he pulled me aside one day because I, I kind of ticked him off in a meeting. He goes, look, he says, you're really good at what you do. He says, I'm going to teach you something. Be patient and professional in what you do. He said, you can be hard driven, but you can't be hard driven to a point where you get somebody mad. I always remember that. I think he moved to Ohio someplace. Another person was, he was named Mel Siegel. He was my regional manager and he gave me a management job. You know, the company sales manager's job opened a brand new branch. And I asked him one day, I said, why'd you do that? He goes, he says, you have no rules. You just do what you got to do and you get it done without breaking the rules. That's the thing about you. <laughs> I said, okay. And then another person was named Tim Reedy. Tim was the vice president of finance and marketing of our company. And uh, he's the one that told me, he says, whatever you do, whatever mistakes you make, make sure it don't cost the cost of company. And I, I never went to him for any one of these guys for anything that was because I knew them, but I knew them because I didn't do everything, like, I didn't go with them as often. And they knew that. And when I did, they knew I needed them. And they helped me. You valued their time. I did, I valued their time, I valued their professionalism, I valued their expertise. And they, shot, and they taught me. Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting, the lessons we learn, and then the, the, those same lessons we want to pass on to the folks that we come in contact with. Yes. And I think it's, it's really interesting when we can, when we can share those and, and demonstrate to our mentors that we, did, we were listening. <laughs> we did take their advice to heart. And when this episode goes live, you can forward it to them so they can <laughs> hear you give them a shout out. Well, here's, uh, well, I know as we can write down one of our time here, 
I don't know what uh, faith you are, and that's not really important right now, but for me, I've been on this journey for many years, and uh, Kurt, who's the uh, the pastor, my friend, Harry, one of the things I always thought about was that I started a lot of good companies. I had a lot of good ideas. I had people that built technology for me and kept driving it. And he asked me a question. He goes, why do you think that never became successful as you wanted it to? Well, I says, Kurt, I says, I never prayed for myself, ever. He goes, why not? I says, because God gave me all these gifts to talk and the ability to network with people and to bring resources in. He goes, but Ray, it's not up to you. <laughs> I said, okay. He said, I'm going to have you read a book. And the book was Visioneering by uh, Andy Stanley out of uh, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. When I read the book, and there's a saying out, there's a couple of sayings. One is that you do all the work and God's got the how. And the other one is you do your best and God's got the rest. <laughs> so when you depend on God to money, some direction, contacts, I don't know about you, but there's been people in my life that have come in my life and all of a sudden disappeared. For good reasons sometimes. <laughs> I didn't understand. I thought maybe it was me, but it wasn't me. It's just that <laughs> it, it didn't, wasn't working out. Yeah. And um, so I, I teach that to my group too. I, and I asked them, I said, look, if this offends you, I said, I can understand that, but I'm going to be who I am. I'm going to speak from my heart. Yeah, anybody that comes on board is going to understand that too. I hope I didn't offend you at all. But uh, No, not at all. Not at all. I'm, I'm, um, folks who know me know that I wear my spirituality on my sleeve and like, I have a deep connection to spirit. And so I, I'm, I do meditations and I make intentions every morning and... <laughs> I'm conscious of being in the in the in a state of gratitude as much as possible, and then also just, you know, asking for what I need help with, and um, you know, if you, as they say, asking, it shall be given. <laughs> well, I give an example. So we have this okay and this funding. And I don't know if you ever heard the story about the man on the roof and a flood. I don't think so. No. And a helicopter comes, and the guy says, "No, I'm waiting. I'm waiting." A lifeboat comes, a raft comes. He goes, "I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait." A lifesaver comes by. The guy drowns. He goes up to heaven. He goes, God, how can you just save me? He goes, wait a minute. I sent you a helicopter. I sent you a boat. I sent you a life rat, uh, this lifesaver. I said, I was trying to help you. You didn't get the cues. <laughs> and I think that happens in our, our lives sometimes. We're waiting for that epiphany to have a bolt of lightning come down and strike us and say, now you know. Yeah, yeah. But that's not the way God works. He works through people like you that come to, you know, we're talking now. We're talking out loud. And, you know, how do we walk away from this conversation to move us forward. And it's a relationship, I think, for me, based on listening to your voice and the way you speak, is to move forward. Yeah. Keep on moving, keep on connecting, because you never know. Taking imperfect action. Yes. Perfect is the enemy of done, as my one of my coaches likes to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ray, I really appreciate uh, the, the team reaching out to me. I think it's a testament to the little the PR a work you are doing because I had not heard of you at all. You weren't on, on my radar and uh, we had a couple of uh, opportunities to connect and we finally made it happen. And so I think it's interesting because like I said early on, it's early days for you. So it's going to be fascinating to watch your journey. But I think everything has prepared you for this moment. When you look at your history, when you look at your experience, when you look at the things that you're passionate about, when you talk about legacy, I mean, when you talk about your family and talking about even thinking about them in future roles, it seems like everything has been coming into, into place and not maybe in a way that you would have thought of or could have dreamed of, yeah. you know, 10 years ago or even five years ago. But but I think now we all we can see all the hard work that we've put in is paying off. And I feel that that's what, what's happening for you here. So really excited for your journey ahead. Well, thank you very much, Harry. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure working with you. And I'm glad you uh, were patient with me. <laughs> and uh, having this conversation here. Thank you very much. Yeah. And so if, if folks want to learn more, the best place to go right now is terra, terrafirmafoods.world? Yes. Okay. Yes. And there's information, there's uh, links there for people to get in contact with you, investors, obviously, if they're interested or partners, anyone who's looking to have a conversation, you can start there. And then any of the resources or books we mentioned in the in the conversation, we'll make sure we pull those out into the show notes as well. Okay. If folks want to get uh Directly con connected with you is the website the best place or any any other place to connect? I'll just I will put my telephone number out there. It's uh, 630-429-4025 okay. or ray at terraformafoods.world. Okay. All right, Ray. I really appreciate you sharing your story and um, we'll stay connected or, or catch each other at a conference sometime in the future. We will. 
We will. This is the year. Thanks again to Ray for coming on the show and sharing his story. As always, full show notes available at verticalfarmingpodcast.com. Thanks to our platinum sponsor, Cultivated. If you are looking for a vertical farm and don't know where to start or which technology would suit your needs, reach out to them today. Do yourself a favor. Best of all, the service is free because they work on behalf of their partners. Learn more at cultivated.com. If you don't know by now, it's C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-D.com. Just leave out that last E. If you're ready to get out and about and attend your first vertical farming podcast conference or your first one since the pandemic, I can't think of a better one to attend than Indoor Ag. Indoor.ag is the website. Save an additional 25% off registration with their promo code VFPOD22, which they've created just for our listeners. As mentioned at the top of the show, verticalfarmingjobs.com, newly created job board if your company is ready to list some open positions in the industry. Use promo code VFJ Podcast, all one word, for 75% off your postings. Podcast production and marketing provided by Fullcast. If your company is ready to have a conversation about how a podcast could be beneficial for your business, learn more at fullcast.co. Don't forget, if you're enjoying the show, leave us a rating and a review. Rate this podcast.com forward slash VFP. We'll be sure to read those out on future episodes. Tune in next week for my conversation with Christine Zimmerman, the chairwoman at the Association for Vertical Farming based in Munich, Germany. This is a conversation I've been wanting to have for years since I started the podcast and I wanted to highlight the great work that Christine and her team are doing. And I was really honored that she uh, and I were able to make some time to have this conversation. So I know you'll enjoy that. Make sure you tune in for that one. Until we meet again, here's to your health. Thanks for listening. To read the full show notes for this episode, which includes any links mentioned in the episode, as well as a full show transcription, visit verticalfarmingpodcast.com. There, you can sign up for our email list to be notified when new episodes are published. 